My name is Leanne and I'm an instructor and board member at the Tachinta Center for Research and Learning and I'm facilitating our event today. I'm coming to you from my own territory, Michisagi Kinishnabek Aki. The Chinta's head office is located in the gorgeous territory of the Yellowknives Dene First Nation, and we would not exist as an organization without their generosity, patience, expertise, and their magnificent understanding of their homeland. I would like to welcome you all to this virtual space. We have folks joining us from Hawaii, the Hawaiian diaspora, and from all over Turtle Island, including lots of folks from Benande. At the Chinta, we are brought together by our care for the land, each other, and our desire to revitalize and practice indigenous ways of knowing and being. Through our programs, we strive to create Northern Indigenous communities that are radically self-determining, healthy, sustainable, and connected to Indigenous knowledge and practices. We aim to ensure that the programming we offer is accessible to all community members, including parents, youth, women, and two-spirit, trans, and queer people. Our work at the Chinta is to serve the needs of Northern Indigenous communities through education, research, and community-based programming. We offer Indigenous-centered arts, culture, language, and educational programming in an innovative land-based environment. We have a lot of programming coming up. For those of you in the Yellowknife area, watch for our annual Hlihua camp or fish camp in the next few weeks at Mackenzie Island. We're also a regional host for the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Conference this year. And we will be having events virtually in Whitehorse, in Yellowknife and in several regions in May and June. We're currently running some university courses at Hliwa Camp and Hyde Camp in June. And the virtual Sech Kona Getso speaker series will be returning to the airwaves on March 2nd with a talk by Tiffany Eilich. I invite you today to create with me a supportive, kind, and respectful environment for our speaker and all of our participants today. I will be facilitating a curated question and answer section at the end of the talk. Please type your questions into the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, a special Masi to Collective Broadcast, which is an artist-run collective specializing in live streaming and tech solution for arts organization and not-for-profits. And they're helping us today with the tech side of things. Um, Sydney Krill made the posters and the graphics for today. So Masi to Sydney. We are honored that you're able to join us. We're recording the webinar and we'll post uh, the webinar on our website. We are here today to celebrate Jamaica Hioli Malikalani Osorio's new book, Remembering Our Intimacies. Mo'olelo, aloha anya, and e'a. Hioli is a Kanaka Maoli Wahini artist, activist, scholar, and educator. Hioli is an assistant professor of Indigenous and Native Hawaiian politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This book for me has been one of the greatest gifts of 2021. It's a brilliant offering of unapologetic love of land, ocean, people, culture, language, and story. Hioli is a genius storyteller and poet and has managed to root this work in community and organizing while also being in conversation with indigenous studies, queer studies and indigenous and decolonial feminisms. It's just a beautiful piece of work and I'm really honored to be in conversation with Hioli today. So take it away, Hioli. Mahalo, Leanne. Um... 
Alo mai kako o vauno o Jamaica he oli mali kalani o zoyo he kupono ka aina o palolo ka uli li lehua ka makani wai o mao. Um, good day. My name is um, Jamaica he oli he oli mali kalani whatever you want to call me. I'm um, native Hawaiian, born and raised on the island of Oahu, originally uh, raised in Palolo Valley, but now I live in Wahiawa, uh, basically like the people, the center of Oahu. Um, I am uh, taking my time to introduce myself because I'm a little starstruck by that introduction that uh, Leanne just gave. Um, so let, let's just get into it. Okay, so I am really, really blessed and honored to be here today um, to talk about this book, this labor of love, um, remembering our intimacies, mo'olelo, aloha, aina, and ea. Um, and I think the, the way I'd like to do this is um, well, I guess I'll tell you, I'm going to do a quick reading. I'll tell you a little bit about what I think the book is doing or what I set out to do in the book. And then we can get into the real interesting stuff and be in, in conversation. Uh, the book is dedicated to three women, uh, three wahine who have had a tremendous impact, not just on my life, but on, on Hawaii and the Pacific at large. Um, my great grandmother, Eliza, uh, um, the late great uh, auntie of the of Pacific studies and of the Pacific Teresia Te Aiwa, and um, also the late great um, radical brilliant Aloha Aina Kumu Auntie Halani K Trask, um, and in many ways this this book was a dream um, that. You know, I don't know if they dreamed, but I dreamed that they dreamed. Um, and it's dedicated to all the wahine, the, the women the, um, who lead us, who hold us, who love us and dream for better futures for us uh, and fight for better futures for us. And then the last thing I wanna say before I get into the reading is that this, the cover art where this image comes from uh, that I'm sharing with you, this background image comes from, it was created by another brilliant Aloha uh, artist named Haley Ka'ili Ehu, um, who was, I believe, born and raised on Maui, but now lives in Hamakua in Pa'oilo, um, and uh, is just someone I always wanted to collaborate with. So I'm really honored to have her artwork on my book, and I hope that if you are as inspired by the art on the cover as I am, that you go uh, check her out. Okay, um, so let's begin with a reading. <clears throat> When my father was eight years old, he took a trip with his older brother, Tom, and their paternal grandparents to witness the eruption at Kilauea Iki. The four Osorio Kane piled into the car with my great grandmother, Eliza Kamakubivoole, and made the long drive from Hilo into Volcano. As they were driving, they could see Kilauea Iki spitting her magma up into the atmosphere. My father recalls how they could see the fountain erupting from inside the car. At its highest, it soared up more than 1,100 feet. They parked along the side of the road, then walked the Lehua and Ohello lined path now known as Devastation Trail. I imagine when they arrived at the lookout, the two boys were struck by an awe only known to someone who has witnessed some kind of birthing. Here, their onehanao, the sands of their birth expanding before them. They'd only been at the edge of Kilauea Iki for a moment when my father, the youngest traveler, and two young to have fully internalized what stories are meant to be quiet or to know which names can be said out loud, leaned over to his very Christian grandmother and asked, Ma, is that Pele? As silently and quickly as Pele's path can change, as swiftly as she can target new prey and swallow new ili, my great grandmother turned back to the luahine and walked, turned her back to the luahine and walked along the trail back to the car. She climbed in and shut the door. Annoyed with his brother's naivete, Tom snapped, why'd you have to go and ask that for? He had known what my father did not. Tom knew not to speak of Pele that fierce and powerful Akua who stood starkly in opposition to the teachings the boys had received in their Sunday school classes from their grandmother through his elder sibling wisdom, 
Tom had learned which stories were meant for casual conversations and which were to be left as whispers, caught in the back of the throat, not to be freed casually, if ever. As the three, Osorio Kane took the long trail back to the car, my father absor absorbed this devastating lesson as well. And I imagine how that punishing silence closing like a steel car door against a boy's curiosity about how an island can give birth from nothing if, t if she too is not a god had itself developed through long force of habit. This story tells me a few things about this beautiful, strong, and resolute woman my great-grandmother Eliza Lealohakamakvole Ozorio was. It tells me that she loved Hawaii. She must have loved Hawaii. She sang about Hawaii, wrote about Hawaii, and she must have also believed in the mana, the power of Hawaii, if she so clearly wanted to take that drive to bear witness to her island growing. The story also tells me that she loved her ohana. Eliza didn't venture into Kilauea, Kilauea Iki alone. She chose to take her mo'opuna, her grandchildren, to share with these boys that moment of pure awe that comes from observing this birthing because to love your ohana is to share intimacy with them, to create memories that will become mo'olalo for future generations. From what I've heard, Eliza was full of this kind of aloha. But most of all, this mo'olalo tells me that my great grandmother was not only a God fearing, but a Pele fearing woman. When my father uttered Pele's name, it was her power, not Jesus's, that forced my great-grandmother to look away and retreat from the burning crater. In two syllables, his preeminence had been challenged. My father had realized what Tom did not say and what Eliza already must have known. That a wahine who births land out of darkness is, was, and will always be a god. Once spoken, it was Pele's mana that would not allow my kupuna to witness it any longer because it challenged the mo'olalo Eliza had been taught in her father's sanctuary. In this moment, my great-grandmother was confronted and torn in half by two distinctly different mo'olalo. One that celebrated the mana, the power, and everything around and inside of her, and another that gave her virtue, structure, and a path not to devastation, but to paradise. This is the story I think about when I wonder how traditions and memory can come to be dismembered over time, how fear turns to shame and finally hardens to silence, how an ohana, a family born from Kilauea's fiery belly comes to deny their kupuna and Akua's first name, Peleho Nuamea. How a young boy and later a whole ohana are urged to forget, or like Tom, at least remain silent about their first home in Pele's bosom. So this, um, this reading comes from the prologue, uh, the, the beginning of my book, and kind of sets the stage for the larger mo'olalo, the, the larger story that this, that this book is trying to tell. Um, the images you just saw are, are actual archival video footage I found online this week of the eruption that my father and his brother and my great grandmother all witnessed together in the telling of this story. Um, and so this book begins with the story of my family, but also the, the story of Hi'iaka and Pele, and Pele being the, the, the woman of the crater, the, the volcano itself, the lava itself, that who, who births islands. Um, as a launching point to talk about and, and celebrate what we call aloha aina, um, intimacy, relationality, and, and governance. And, and I, take, I take, I think, great time to talk about this, this thing we call aloha aina um, and to reimagine what aloha aina might be beyond kind of simple translations of nationalism or patriotism and really look into our mo'olalo, our stories, our narratives, our histories um, to, to tell a broader, perhaps more aina-based, land-based story. So when I think about aloha aina, I think about what it means to love like aina, to love like the land. 
Um, so in the first four chapters of the book, I, I trace foundational Hawaiian epistemologies, right? So things like mo'olelo, what it means to think of, of narratives as more expansive than just history or legend. Um, I think about aloha aina, I think about mo'oku auhau, genealogy, resistance and resurgence, and I trace these epistemologies through a story, um, through a grand narrative um, and a, a collection actually of, of hi'iaka and pele mo'olalo because the hi'iaka and pele, I guess we, we could say like universe uh, or um, canon, there's, there's, multiple, there's dozens of versions of this story. So I trace this through multiple versions of this, of this mo'olalo. Um, as a way to situate these knowledges and these epistemologies in the words of our ancestors. Um, and this is something that I learned to do both from the storytellers and in my life around me, from my father, from my, my grandfather, my grandmother, but also that uh, these are methods that I saw being implemented in indigenous and native studies um, and people really situating the theories of indigenous studies in, um, this place-based specificity of, of our own native knowledge. So it was kind of a, a project I was excited to, to see what that would do if we looked at, at our mo'olelo in these ways. Um, and so specifically, I highlight uh, kanaka Maoli intimacies, uh, our relationships between each other, our relationships with our aina and our ancestors. I look at the way that Christianity and, and their missions really dismembered our relations to each other. and um, not just simplified, but really um, both erased and reduced our relations. Um, and so I look to the stories of our kupuna to see all the different ways we were relating to each other, all, all the different language, all the different descriptions, all the aloha, the, the love and desire and pleasure that is found there. And in doing that, I try to offer a counter or alternate epistemologies of governance and nation building. Um, epistemologies and practices that may allow us to refuse Western practices of governance or Western uh, visions of governance so that we may free ourselves um, into, you know, a different ontology. Um, and I, I think about this as, as really important as we as Native people and, and in particular as, as Kanaka Moli, as Native Hawaiians are, are thinking really critically about what it means to nation build. Um, while under ongoing military occupation and uh, ongoing settler colonial violence. Um, in the final chapters, I, I move from the mo'olalo, from the story of hi'iaka i kapoli opele, and kind of bring the theories found in those stories um, into the present to analyze what it means to strive for Native Hawaiian futures in a settler occupying state. Um, so I narrow the focus from here are all the relationships we have to looking at just a couple um, specific relationships, Kama'aina and Malihini. Uh, and these are relationships that dictate both your relationship to the land, but also uh, your relationship to the people around you. And these, these are relationships that have been retranslated and reduced by the settler state to mean local and tourist. And so I actually historicize what these terms mean and why that appropriation is really not only ineffective, but really inappropriate. Um, and I use that to help us see how ongoing dislocations, dismemberment, disbodiment of our relationships continue to obstruct our ability to challenge and offer alternatives to settler colonialism. Um, and a, a really simple way to think about this is trying to make connections for our community and why um, not just acceptance, but celebration of intimacy beyond heteronormativity, right? Beyond, you know, the, the, the straight expectations of empire are actually integral to the way that we're going to think about nation building and the way that we might uh, design a new future, both an ancient and new future. Um, in the last, last chapter that was actually written while we were on uh, Mount Awakea in 2019. So I thought the book was done. I was submitting final revisions and then we were all called to the Mauna in 2019 to protect her, um, to block further desecration of her, uh, block the construction of more of these little pimples 
uh, we call them pimples there, telescopes, uh, on the summit of the Mauna. Um, and so I was inspired in that moment to reimagine actually what the teachings of the book were and how that might be relevant to the very urgent moment we were sitting in on the Mauna. Um, and to kind of look at how intimacy can help us think not only about governance, but about movement building and power building. Um, and I try to, you know, both reimagine what these Mo'olelo teach us about jurisdiction, about the law, about kana vai, a word that for us way predates the law, but is a way to think about, um, or, you know, both organizing principles, but also um, accountability to each other and the land. Um, and to show that we, we don't have to, we don't have to practice the law and governance again, the way that the Western world has basically assumed that the only way to govern, the only civilized way to govern is, um, and that our Mo'olelo show us dozens and dozens and dozens of other ways to practice governance that are much more connected actually to the environment we live in. Um, and so ultimately what I hope the last chapter and really the book is saying is that it's really our stories um, and not just the story of Hi'iaka Ikapoliopele that, that I study, but all of our stories from time immemorial to now, even the stories we're creating now, and our aloha for each other, our deep and profound love and appreciation for each other that provide us with everything we need to be victorious, to be uh, living in, you know, in, in an honest way as Kanaka, and to keep each other safe. It's the, the work of the book is really to tell us that tilina, intimacy, relationships, um, is going to challenge the way we think about kuleana, responsibilities and privileges, or what some might call positionality, and how that's going to have a compounding effect and how we think about governance, uh, how we think about what it, what it means to govern in a way that is pono, that is balanced, that is in alignment with the teachings of our ancestors, and that that will always uh, require us to remember to cherish each other in this work and not forsake each other in this work. And so, you know, the final, you know, spoiler alert, the final lesson of, of the book is really that um, we came to protect this Mauna. We all showed up saying we were there to protect Aina and protect this Mauna. And many of us learned that we were actually there to protect each other. Um, and we learned that those things were actually the same and that we were bound in a different kind of intimacy with each other because of our love for the land. And that was going to require us to basically level up in the way that we care for each other. Um, so, yeah, that's that is the book. Um, that's the whole thing. Uh, there's nothing else in there. No, there's probably there's a lot other stuff in there. And, and the, the hope was both to you know, create theory and story that was going to be relevant, not just to Native Hawaiians, not just to the Pacific, but uh, but to any Native people and also other people of color who are struggling under empire and, and organizing under empire, um, but, but also to do so in a way that also challenged the conventions of academic writing. So if, if you read the book, you'll notice that there's a lot of kind of code switching between the academic and the, the more poetic uh, and the more creative. And that was a really intentional part of the book as well. But I think I'll stop there because I'm sick of the sound of my voice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that was okay. That was awesome. We are we are not sick of the sound of, of your voice. <laughs> um, yeah, so congratulations. This is a profound and, and beautiful work. I'm just going to remind our participants to type uh, any questions that you might have into the Q&A. And maybe that's a really good place to begin because as an academic and as an intellectual work, this detonated a lot of conventions in the academy, which I loved. I loved the code switching, even though I think I can read a lot of the codes. I love that you wove story into everything. I love that you had no issue breaking into poetry when it was necessary. And you forced me to reckon with the fact that I was reading it in English and that's the language of our colonizers on every page. And I do that as well with my use of Anishinaabe Moin, but this was one of the first times that I had like a big list and it slowed my reading process down. 
it forced me to really think about the concepts that you were talking about in your language, in my language, and I really, really appreciated it. And I loved how much of this work came from sort of movement work and, and organizing. So um, I was, I wanted to ask you why you chose to tell this story in this way. Hmm. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I mean, sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice. Um, sometimes I feel like there was no other way to tell this story. Um, that if if I tried, if I tried to fit into the the conventions entirely, that I would have just been really unhappy and, and never finished it. And that and one of the lessons really of these mo'olelo and the, the blessing, God, I feel so lucky that I got to spend a few years just reading stories that my ancestors both told for generations and then painstakingly wrote down for us um, and published in Hawaiian language newspapers that I got to like live in the 1800s for, for a few years and like to read their stories and also read the articles that were published by their stories. And one of the things that became really clear from reading those mo'olelo, reading those stories, is that um, we do a disservice as, and I'll just speak as, as Native Hawaiian scholars, um, when we maintain the boundary uh, between the critical and the creative, when we help to uphold that violence, that severing between the two sides of our brains and the two sides of our bodies and the two sides of our stories and creativity, um, that that's a violence on our stories. That's a, that's a violence on our epistemology. And so I, you know, I, I wanted the book to, to read like it felt to read these mo'olelo for the first time in, in my own language. And, you know, a lot of people ask me like, why did you write it in English? Well, I, I wrote it in English because I could not have written it in Hawaiian. I do not, I can read and research in Hawaiian, um, but I, I do not have the poetic skill in Hawaiian that my ancestors had. And as a poet, like I, I needed the book to be beautiful, right? I didn't want it to be someone stumbling through language, although that would have been an interesting project, I think. Um, and the, the other reason I really tried to tell these stories in this way is that you know, that this isn't going to be news to you and certainly not to any, probably anyone on this, in this conversation, but so much of what's done in the academy and in scholarship is so inaccessible, inaccessible to our communities. And therefore it's not relevant. Even if the theory in it put into practice could be useful, if like my cousins and, and my brother and my sister aren't going to read the book, um, aren't going to be inspired by the book, it's, to me, it was useless. So I also wanted to tell the story in a way that I could see my family being in conversation, especially if I was going to talk about my family. Um, I didn't want to like talk about them in this other space. And so there are all these kind of competing um, uh, reasons and, and feelings why the, why the story had, had to be told in this way. And I feel really lucky that I was supported by, you know, originally this, the first form of this was my dissertation and I was really supported by my chair, Craig Howes. Um, I always felt like he had my back um, and pushed, you know, if people needed to be pushed, he pushed for me so that I could just write. Um, and then I was really pleasantly surprised that when I went to turn this into a book, I found a publisher who didn't fight me on the creativity and didn't I was so ready to fight about all the Hawaiian language and all the refusal to translate I, I'm always ready for a fight and there was no fight I was like this is crazy so that also reveals to me that one I have a lot of gratitude for the native scholars who have come before because there wasn't a fight because someone else fought <laughs> um but also there's more space for us to to do things in a way that's genuine than maybe we think sometimes um, so that was a, that was a pleasant surprise. I really loved um, how you begin the book with um, that dedication to, to those important aunties, um, to Grandma Groovy and uh, Hanani Kechask. Um, and that was really, really meaningful to me because in reading this, reading your book, mm. I was thinking about how much 
Hawaiian women, Nui Silva, Noelani Goodyear, Manolani Meyer, mm. Hoanani have influenced me, particularly when I was um, just an emerging academic. I remember, you know, from a Native daughter blew my mind. And I saw that fire, that heart, that mm. sort of the poetry, the activism, that I wasn't seeing sort of where I was coming from, but I, I saw it from this distance. And that was so important to me in the development of me as a writer and a poet and a, and doing kind of movement work. And so it was so amazing to see that trajectory and how you recognized and um, celebrated and affirmed those women for the for weaving those fine baskets of resilience to carry our daughters. And I like, that was so beautiful. And I thought, Oh, I feel like I was one of those daughters that was in the basket too, even though they probably didn't even, they didn't know they had like some Ojibwe from the <laughs> snow in the basket too. <laughs> oh, and that, but that's the thing about like, um, I mean, that's the thing about these, these women in our communities that they're, they're carrying everyone that they're thinking about and they're carrying so much more too, right? That that this is the the real strength of of these wahine. I feel like like you. I just I feel so lucky to to follow behind them, uh, to have been able to read their work. And I think it's no surprise that a lot of these really powerful scholars are also poets, right? Both Teresia Teaiwa and Honani K. Trask are incredible poets. Um, and you know, Honani in her, her published work didn't really move between the, the poetry and, and the critical, but I imagine that's also a, a product of the time that she was publishing. Um, but it was always really clear to me growing up that, um, I don't know, there was a connection between these brilliant critical minds and the fact that they were also these beautiful, tender, vulnerable poets. Um, so I don't know, I'm so, I'm so blessed and inspired by them. I loved your line um, where you, you talk about this story that you're telling in the book as a gathering place, as refuge for Indigenous queers, where you talk about it's not enough just to deoccupy our lands first, and then we'll get to the gender and the sexual violence and all those issues later, which we hear lots in our communities here as well. But you really make the case that um, it's it's that work, it's those diverse articulations of gender and sexualities and relationships that are going to drive and build um, the nation building, the world building movement that, that we're in. So it seemed like this was such a beautiful practice of that, creating this, a practice of a gathering space, a practice of a refuge, a practice of a centering in terms of governance in the book. Um, and I just wondered if you could if you could say more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something I actually learned a lot from um, from other Native scholars, from Chris Finley. When I read um, "Bringing Sexy Back," uh, I can't remember the whole title. Something about the the Native bull dyke out of the closet, um, and the way that that she talked about historicizing our traditions and not using culture or tradition as an excuse for um, exclusion of queer peoples. Um, and then when I read uh, I See Your Light out of, uh, out of your book um, and Queer Indigenous Normativities, I think is the title, yeah. Um, these things really opened my mind into what it looked like, not just to theorize around native genders and sexualities and, and relationalities, but really to think about what this means for how we move in ceremony, how we move in, in movement building. And if, and if it's relevant to that, then it's absolutely relevant to how we move in nation building. And of course, this is really influenced by the things that I've read by uh, radical black feminist scholars who always insisted, like, we're not doing this, like, I don't know, civil rights stuff and then dealing with the women's issue later. Like we're carrying this labor. We are being, you know, doubly harmed by empire, by patriarchy. Um, and in fact, it is the attentiveness to patriarchy that is going to um, that is going to liberate us, right? It's, it's an attentiveness and a deconstruction of patriarchy that's gonna liberate all of us. Um, 
And, you know, those were all things that I felt, but I didn't have language for. And I think that's one of the really powerful um, offerings of being a student, uh, being an academic, is that there's all these places that we can find that language. And so when I found that language in, you know, in your work, in Audre Lorde's work, in, um, in Angela Davis's work, in Chris Finley's work, in Miley Arvin's work, um, it gave me permission to think about, okay, when taking this language, what does that look like when like planting it into our own land? Um, and because I'm not a farmer, um, that meant like, what, what land base am I gonna return to? Well, I'm gonna return to the soil of our stories. Um, and I'm gonna see what, not just the, the specific way these stories talk about leadership and governance, but how that can't be detangled from the way that these people are loving. Um, because there are many, unfortunately, um, and I'm sure this is not, we're not exceptional in Hawaii to this, but, but there are really many people in Hawaii who believe that uh, the issues that women face, the issues that poor people face, the issues that queer people face are, um, are almost like accidental and, and not central to the issues we face as a nation, as a lahui, as a collective of people. And that really the problem is we are not self-governing. And it is a problem that we are not self-governing, but to me it would be um, an even bigger problem if we were self-governing like our occupiers. Um, to me, that is not liberation. To me, that is regime change. And so I wanted to be able to say that hopefully in a way that didn't just speak to people who look, live, and, and love like me, but to people who aren't really making that connection yet. And then, you know, just to go back to the, the first part of your question, you talked about the, the gathering place. Um, I've, that was actually one of the last revisions. That part of that chapter was one of the last things I wrote in the book. Um, and it came after getting really good feedback from Lani Tevez, because she was one of the readers on the book. And she just, I don't know, she gave me a lot of things to think about, about how this text works uh, in terms of queer theory and, and queer studies. Um, and I had struggled through most of my life with figuring out how I fit into the queer community. Um, because like, I think like a, I learned later in life, like a lot of native queer people, I didn't really feel like that was a space that was mine. Uh, I felt like for the most part, the spaces that I had been introduced to were very white um, and, you know, privileged. And I didn't really identify with the people in that space. And so that resulted in a kind of repulsion on my half to like queer spaces. Uh, and that was also a byproduct of the fact that I grew up really lucky to be in a family that celebrated who I was. Um, and so trying to come to terms with that and what it meant to be, to want to be a scholar that can be recognized to other queer peoples, to know that like, this is a place that is safe. This is a pu'uhonua, this is a place of refuge and gathering and thinking and dreaming um, without necessarily having to reduce myself to language uh, that I just felt like didn't fully identify who I was. And so a part of the dream was not only to gather with everyone in the Hawaiian community, but to gather with queer people of all other communities to really talk about how is it that we fit in these, in these multiple responsibilities and privileges together. Um, and can we be, um, can, can we, I don't know how to say this. Can um, can we make ourselves visible in a way that creates security for each other? Um, and so, yeah, that was that was the hope. I think with that part of the book is to show people that, that I was trying to do that at least. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it, I think you uh, you achieved that. I think that was really effective. Um, I just want to remind our, our audience to uh, type, don't be shy, type your, your questions into the Q&A. Um, you talked about movement building, movement work, sort of at the end of the book. And I'm wondering if you could, could talk just a little bit more about how that activism and those mobilizations sort of informed, um, informed the, the approach that you took in the book. 
Yeah. So this, there, there's a lot of ways the movement to protect Mauna Kea both changed and transformed my life and, and transformed the book. And one of, one of the big ways is that I, I grew up a lot, both as a, as a native person and as a scholar between 2014 and 2019. And so 2014 is when kind of the first major visible presentation of uh, and like reaching beyond Hawaii, the movement to protect Mauna Kea, you know, like that's when you see Jason Momoa posting shirtless pictures saying we are Mauna Kea and everyone talking about it. Um, and in 2014, I really saw the, this movement to be like almost purely political in a sense that this was really about self-governance. This was really about self-determination. This is totally about who has the decision, who has the power to make the decisions about what we're going to do on our land. Um, it wasn't about our intimacy with the land. It wasn't in my mind. It wasn't about ceremony. Um, it wasn't about religious practice. It wasn't about aloha. It wasn't about love, this deep and intense desire. It, it was about like the political in the purest sense. And thank God I grew up a bit because somehow between 2014 and 2019, and not actually somehow, it was actually going to the Mauna. It was going to visit this place and being in her shade, being in her protection and being embraced both by her protection and her freezing temperatures and, mm -hmm. and all the things that that brings that made it so clear that everything I thought about this movement and therefore because this movement is really the movement of my generation. So everything I thought about movement building period had to be rethought uh, because I was thinking through the frame of colonial power and I couldn't see beyond what it meant to build power in that, in, in that universe. And that's that's when I learned really quickly, not just what our mo'olelo, what our stories tell us about Alohaina, but what the aina actually tells us about Alohaina, because it will change everything you think. Um, and so being there um, and being accountable to the mauna and being accountable to the, in most cases, for me, it was women standing beside me, being accountable to those women and realizing that when you're standing to protect a mountain, the mountains at your back, she's got your back and you're standing beside all these women. And in front of you is a long range acoustic device, also known as a sound cannon and hundreds of men with in their like riot gear and their batons and their tear gas and, and all of these things. In that moment, I'm not thinking about um, Hawaii is an illegally occupied nation state, was never legally annexed, and the, the statehood vote, vote in 1959 was all a damn ruse. Like, I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking about the laws. I'm not thinking about whose jurisdiction is this land under and how can we utilize that to our advantage? No, I'm thinking about how do I protect the woman beside me and myself? And how do we make sure we are not moved? And what is it about this place? And, and Havane Rios, 10 feet down, chanting a chant that we've chanted since time immemorial. What is it about that that makes us powerful, right? Havane re reminded me um, in that time that like, we know this chant, whatever chant it is, right? We know this chant because someone somewhere never stopped chanting even with all the assaults and all the ways it was criminalized, right? Like we know this hula because somewhere, someone somewhere never stopped dancing. We know this language because someone somewhere never stopped speaking. And in those moments, I could care less about the laws. I could care less about who's the governor or the king or, you know, do we have a constitutional monarch? None of that mattered. All that mattered is how do we honor our relations to each other? How do we insist that the most important thing is how we care for each other? Um, and I couldn't learn that in a book, right? Honani K. Trask says in her essay from a native daughter in the, the book by the same title, she says, in order to, um, I used to have this memorized, but in, in, in order to like understand her history, she had to put the books down. She had to study her language. She had to get her hands dirty. She had to learn to love the land like a lover. And to me, that's, that's something you learn only 
you're not you're not even gonna learn that in my book like you have to actually go to your places to learn that to feel that to be changed in that way um and and when that happens um, everything is new and i think that's the enduring gift that even under long-standing occupation even while we are continually assaulted by the state and and all forms of violence that the Aina, the land, still gives back to you. That if you meet her there, he aloha, he alo, face to face, um, she will transform you more than anything else in the world. Um, and so I tried to articulate that as best as I could in, in the last chapter, um, that transformation. And, and then the hope is really, you know, that people don't take, don't take my word for it. Go try it, you know, <laughs> go, go try it and see see what that feels like um so yeah that's the way i'm thinking about that yeah i think that's i think that that's exactly what i connected um that's why i, I feel so strongly about this book i feel like it was it was that connection that love of land that land as pedagogy land as teacher land as um, the biggest transformation of your life this generative sight of if you're in relationship with the land, with community, figuring out how to caretake and care for each other is the center of governance, that is our politics, that is our ethics, that's mm -hmm. everything that matters. And so I think I connect, that's why I connected so hard with this book, because that part was just so clear, it came through so clear, and it was so beautiful. So make wedge for that. Um, we have a few minutes left. So this is sort of getting to be your last chance if you're feeling shy about asking questions. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about On the Morning You Wake, it's the End of the World, which I hear is a selection at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. Yes, I can tell you a little bit about that. It's also, so we were at Sundance. Uh, it was also selected for South by Southwest this nice. March. So it'll be in Austin, um, which is pretty exciting. But um, on the morning you wake to the end of the world is a VR, virtual reality. I don't know all the t fancy terms. Uh, it's kind of like a docudrama, actually, um, that takes a look at the 2018 false missile alert in Hawaii. So in January of 2018, um, everyone in Hawaii got a text message basically from the emergency alert system saying that there was a nuclear missile inbound and that we had something like 15 minutes to take cover. Um, it took 38 minutes for any official state of Hawaii person to notify the populace that this was a mistake, uh, that we weren't actually about to be um nuked um and so this this story actually looks the, the purpose of the project is to talk really seriously and hopefully inspire um both you know normal people but also decision makers to take more seriously denuclearization um, and ending the the creation but also decommissioning nuclear weapons um because of all the ways that our that our lives are that that's that's what the project originally was about and when i came into the project i told them that i was going to talk about demilitarization more generally um and the demilitarizing of the pacific and the end of nuclear testing on you know native land and, and particularly speaking from someone in the pacific uh because we have been harmed by nuclear weapons for for decades um and so the project really follows via interview people who were here in Hawaii on that day. Um, and then there's also a poem uh, that I wrote that kind of frames the whole thing. And it talks about, you know, how we are changed and how not just how we are changed, but how we must be changed when you wake up to the end of the world. Um, and it focuses on the way that native people have our world has ended dozens of times before. Um, that we have, we are living in a post-apocalyptic reality, you know, for, for Hawaiians specifically between 1778, the landing of James Cook, who yesterday was the anniversary of when we killed him. So that was a celebration yesterday between his landing and um, the time of our overthrow in 1893, we lost 90% of our population. That's an apocalypse, right? And that is not an experience that unfortunately 
that only Native Hawaiians carry. So trying to reframe a story that was, you know, originally meant to be told to um, folks who don't understand that experience, largely white and, and privileged people who have access to VR, because who has access to VR these days, um, in in a way that really opened their eyes to like, we've actually already been in, apoc in an apocalypse and nuclear warfare, but also climate change um, and growing fascism and the far right are like threatening apocalypse every day. Um, and so there are, this isn't actually just about getting the United States um, and other world powers to take seriously denuclearization. This is about all of us understanding that the way we live in this world is unsustainable um, and we are bringing our own demise. So that's what the project's about. Um, it's my hope that it will, will find a way to make it more accessible to folks who don't have this really expensive technology. Um, but, but yeah, if you're gonna be at South by Southwest in Austin, come check us out um and yeah awesome congratulations we do have a question from the audience how has everything that you've been doing affected your understanding of yourself as a teacher and who hmm. your students are oh craig house this is my um <laughs> by the way thanks craig thanks for the question um that was everything i've been doing you know, I, I don't think this is what Craig means by this question, but three and a half months ago, I became a mother. Um, so everything that I've been doing these days is being a mother. And that is probably the only thing that has changed my life more than being on the Mauna, Um, because it's transformed the way I think about what it means to teach, uh, what it means to be an elder, a makua, a parent, um, what it means to be accountable to the next generation. Like I, I thought about that, you know, as, as Native people, we're, we're always thinking about how do we be accountable to generations before and after, but it's very different when you're holding a part of the after in your hands. Um, and it's one of the beautiful things is, and I've, I've learned, I've seen this in my partner because we're both kind of fiery, angry Native women. Um, that it's softened us in a way mm -hmm. and that we have so much more grace. Um, and sometimes we'll be in conversation. We're like, what, where's this grace coming from? Like, this is not, I want to be angry. Like, I don't want to be thinking about how other people are feeling. Um, and I'm, I'm really actually excited about that because I can already see and feel the way it changes the way I'm in the classroom and changes the way I even think about the classroom. Um, and change the way I think about my res my real responsibilities, both to my students, to Hawaii, to the Pacific, um, and to to Native people, generally. So um, yeah, motherhood will will shake things up. <laughs> yeah, no, I I definitely hear that. I think that my children and parenting has been the greatest teacher and transformative teacher of my life. And I feel like mm. I learned so much from them about politics and governance mm. and, power. Power, and power. Power. Yes. Yeah. yeah. My, yeah. my, my I, I thought I knew about power. I knew nothing about power. Nothing about power. Um, every morning yeah. I, I turn to my daughter and I say, what are you going to teach me today? Cause um, there's always something. <laughs> Yeah, and in my culture, they're definite, we definitely think of children as teachers because they're coming from the spirit world and so yeah. they're closer. And so for me, pregnancy, breastfeeding, birthing, and then parenting, my kids are teenagers now, but still, still, they're still kicking my ass in terms of, <laughs> of learning. And I got a lot so, Do you think you'll write about that, that transformation and this? Yeah. I... I could definitely see myself writing about that. You know, I, I, I took a long time trying to figure out what my next research project was going to be. And there, when, when Malia was my partner, when she was pregnant, I thought, you know, maybe I'll do something similar in method and I'll, I'll look into these more and I'll look specifically at motherhood and, and more closely at Ohana beyond the nuclear family. And, you know, really just trying to figure out how would my kupuna articulate who I am to my child? Um, as a non-birthing mother um, and a non-biological like family member to my child, or just trying to like think through that. Uh, so it's definitely something that I've thought about. Um, I decided that the the specific 
violences we are under right now um, and violences of the state and the need, really need for abolition in terms of policing and prisons has kind of redirected my attention to something a little more overtly political um, in project and in research. But I think eventually the, I'm going to want to talk more about what it means to be a Makua, a parent, and hopefully write something that's not just useful to me, but to others who are on this journey. I was out for a snowy walk right before this with my uh, with my friend and colleague um, Madeline Witung, and she is a new mother as well, and was talking about parenting and sort of radical revolutionary parenting and its links to to abolition and sort of figuring out non punitive ways to raise yeah. raise kids, which I feel like is just such an amazing conversation that. I wish I'd been having 20 years ago when my kids were little, but it's it's very exciting. Well, thank you, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We're like we're out of time. I feel like I could talk to you for um, days. I really hope that the pandemic ends and that we can get you and your family uh, to spend some time with us at Dechinta. And uh, yes. until then, I I wish you and your community and your family good health and. Thank you so much for, for this book and for sharing your time with us today. And thanks for everybody who, who came in and spent their Yellowknife lunch hour with us. Thank you. Thank, I'm so honored to be here. And thank you, Leanne, for having me uh, and everyone who joined us. Hope to see you guys in person someday in the future. <laughs> awesome. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Uh -oh.